His first impression was a grey light, the absence of pain, and a certainty that he was dead. Well, I've just started a new novel, um, and I'm about two months into it, so I'm in the early stage of it, really enjoying it at the moment, because it's a stage where sort of, you're not too invested in it, you're just looking at different ideas, accepting some, rejecting others. It's sort of like playtime at the moment, I'm still trying things out. Tim Bowler is most well known for his mystical, psychological adventure thrillers. He's written ten books, among them Frozen Fire, Storm Catchers and River Boy, and has won numerous awards, including the prestigious Carnegie Medal. At Ivy Bridge Community College near Plymouth, Year 9 pupils are preparing for a visit by the author to come and talk about his work. They've been studying Star Seeker. So you all know that in the novel, we have Mrs Little's box. So we have a little bit of an insight into the character of Mrs Little by what she contains in her box. So then we pose the question of, if another character had a box, what would they put in it? English teacher Kate Martin has been getting her class to make boxes for characters in his other novels. Well, we did Frozen Fire and our character's Dusty. Dusty sees a boy's face at the window and it's made of snow and she um, decides to draw it. Like many writers, Tim Bowler has his own website where students can find out more about him. Tim Bowler was born in Leon C and spent much of his time as a boy in or on or looking at water. At uni he studied Swedish and Scandinavian studies and wrote poetry. After graduating, he worked in, in forestry, timber, teaching and translating, before going full-time as a writer. Tim Bowler lives in a remote rural landscape in Devon. He works in a one-room stone tower known as Tim's Bolt Hole, half a mile from his home. I think it's the seclusion, really. I do need peace and quiet. Um, I need to control my space and know I can't be interrupted. So I suppose there's a monastic element. I'm, I'm more akin to a mystic on a mountaintop than I am to a journalist in a busy office. It's primitive. I can't be found. There's no television here. There's no telephone here. There's no email here. There's a little path that leads to it and then there's some stables close by with a couple of horses in it. If I need a little break from my thoughts, I sometimes wander down to the stables, talk over the problem with the horse. They're very good listeners, horses. They never interrupt you, <laughs> never get in the way. <laughs> and you've, you've aired your problem and I go back to it. It's the morning of the author's visit to Ivy Bridge. What are the students expecting? I like his books because they're very interesting and in depth and they have a lot of meaning and there's always a lot more than what's obvious. The main thing that I actually want to ask him is where does he get his inspiration for it from because all of his books are fairly dark and mysterious. I think his books are really interesting. I really like the way that he focuses them towards teenagers and how he incorporates like teenage issues into them, like death and like family issues of like divorce. He can be quite quiet and subdued. I'm looking forward to meet the author because it's you know, exciting to meet somebody who's um, written such a good book and, um, I don't know, hopefully learn some skills myself for writing stories. Tim Bowler has been to hundreds of schools over the years and knows what makes an author visit go well. The better the prepared the school is, the kids are, of course, um, the better the event's going to go. The best ones are always where you've got the English department very active and, and involved um, and the library and the kids are prepared with questions, they've read your books or they've been on your website, they've found out as much as possible about you, they're ready to get involved. Um, and th those events go well. Occasionally you find a school that clearly has decided that it needs to tick the box which says, have you done an author visit? And they think, oh right, we'll get an author in. And they don't do any more than that. They book the author, the author turns up, and sometimes the staff aren't prepared, the kids don't know who you are, they haven't got any books, um, nothing's, nothing really works, and you end up really having to, to make it happen out of nothing. OK, this is Tim Bowler. Tim Bowler, this is 9X1. Hey. What a thought.
I, I've been in love with books since I was a kid. You know, I've, I've started reading and writing when I was five, and that's what got me going. What happened was my mum bought home this story, Little Tim and the Brave Sea Captain, right? And I read this story and I thought, a story about the sea, lovely. I'm going to write my own first story about the sea. The story of Francis Drake and King Philip of Spain by Tim Bowler, age five. <clears throat> Francis Drake decided to attack King Philip of Spain. <laughs> so he did. <laughs> yes, I think so. What I discovered as the years went rolling by was that, that although as I got older and to your kind of age and then on from there to university and stuff, although I did all the other things that human beings do, you know, sport, career, girls, marriage, all that stuff, this writing thing became so important to me that I found I wanted to just do that, not all the time, but that it was something that was dominating my life. Uh, Tim, um, do you plan a lot in your, before your story, or do you use spontaneous writing and make up as you go along? That's a very good question. In my case, I don't plan very much at all. That doesn't mean you shouldn't. Um, what I say about planning is this. If by nature you're a planner, then plan, that's fine. If you're a list maker, you like, you're more comfortable with structure, that's fine. If you're like me, and you want to get an idea, and just dive in and swim around and see where it goes, make a mess, think, no, rubbish, throw away, start again, start again, start again, think, oh, hang on, this is more like it. If you want to do that kind of thing, that's fine. I like to trust my story-making instinct. I like to take a few risks. If you think about a story, any story, any situation you're in, you could take it into a million different directions if you wanted to. Two people standing at the altar, do you take this man to be your lawful head? What could happen next? Well, hundreds of things. He could say yes, he could say no, he could get shot. Someone could come and say, no, he's married. You know, all kinds of stuff could happen next. But there's one direction the story kind of wants to go. And that's what I call the true north of the story. And I like to experiment a bit until I find my true north, instinctively. I don't want to put my structure down beforehand and say, right, there's my plot. Now I'm going to go through it, painting by numbers. That doesn't mean you shouldn't work that way. There are authors who do that. J.K. Rowling plots in detail, so it works for her. But her method would drive me nuts. You never learn about writing completely. You never master it. I'm not a master of writing. Even Shakespeare, probably, you know, I, to me, he's the boss. He's the, the governor. But I'm a bit, I bet he, at the end of his life, would have said, no, I've still got stuff to learn. You write five novels, that doesn't mean the sixth novel is going to be, oh, right, I've done this before. No, it doesn't work that way, does it? You know, because every story, every poem, every novel, every piece of writing you do is a completely new mountain that you've never been up before. Yes? Earlier you were talking about your imagination. Does it ever scare you? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes it scares me. For me, writing is like, it's like diving into an ocean. And think about that for a moment. I mean, an ocean's a deep place, isn't it? All I know is that the deepest ocean is so scary, I don't want to think of what's down there. Do you? Your imagination is deeper than that because there is no bottom to your imagination. There isn't a bottom. And those of you who want to be writers, I'd say to you, firstly, dream that dream. Yeah, keep that, keep that alive. Don't talk about it unless you've got someone you can talk about it to who will understand about it. But secondly, work that dream. Start now. Don't waste time with your writing, you know. Don't think, OK, I've got to go and get a university degree first. I've got to go and do an evening class or do a PhD in creative writing. Yeah, do that if you want. That's fine. But while you're doing that stuff, be writing too. Be writing. Start now. In Frozen Fire you, and Midget, you put people in vulnerable situations. Why do you do that? If you think about what a story consists of, what is the sort of story we want to read? We, a story really consists of a problem and a resolution. That's what a story is in its basic form. Whether you're talking about highbrow stuff or lowbrow stuff, you know, two dogs after one bone is a problem. Why do we read stories? We read stories to see how something's going to be overcome, how someone's going to change, how some problem's going to be resolved. We don't read stories where everything's working fine, thank you very much, and there's nothing to be sorted out. Do you know what I mean? There's not a story in a way. So I suppose, why do people go into vulnerable situations? Partly it reflects maybe vulnerability that I might feel personally. I'm not conscious of this, it's just an instinctive thing again. And partly it's because, I suppose, it's one of the ways I try to tell a dramatic story. If you don't care about my characters, you won't want to read my story. I want you to really, really care if this little boy, Midget, is going to be murdered by his brother or not. And one of the things I've always tried to do with, with my stories, again, those of you who know my books will know that I do touch on philosophical stuff as well because I'm interested in that. But I do try to make sure there's a rattling good story going on all the time so that while you're reading Starseeker, 
if you're not interested in all that, all the sounds and all the mystical stuff, you've still got a story about a boy being chased by a gang of nasties. A lot of your books involve mystical ideas. Do you have any personal beliefs involving these? Um, so my books are based on, if you like, my own view of the world, which is that, well, you can't summarise it in two words, but, you know, which is, in a nutshell, that I believe in this physical dimension that we experience through our five senses, this solid, physical, phenomenal world of relativity, this time-space dimension. But I also believe in less physical dimensions as well, spiritual dimensions, if you like. And when I write my stories, I like to have characters who experience all of that. The characters that interest me most are the characters like Luke, like Dusty, like Sam in um, Stormcatchers, like Midget, like Jess, to some extent, in Riverboy, who find themselves on the cusp, on the threshold of this physical world and this gateway to less physical, a more spiritual world. That is the one who interests me most. Again, back on ideas, people say, where do the ideas come from? Well, again, I don't plan these at all, but with, with frozen fire, I can tell you where one thing came from. Years and years ago, I knew someone who worked for the Samaritans, who, as you know, take distressed calls and phone calls from people who are often suicidal. And I said to her, what is the toughest phone call? you've ever taken from someone in distress. And she said, without doubt, it's the young man who phoned up. He was about 15, 16. He phoned up and said, if you try and talk me out of this, I'm putting the phone down. I've taken an overdose. I know I'm dying. I don't want to be rescued. I want to die. All I want is a friendly voice from someone I don't know as I slip away. And would you like to take a phone call like that? I'm dying said the voice. Dusty clutched the phone. She had no idea who this was. A boy about her age by the sound of him. Fifteen, sixteen, maybe a bit older. Is anyone there? He muttered. His voice was slurred and angry. She glanced at the clock. Twenty minutes to midnight. She'd answered the phone at once, thinking it would be Dad ringing to say he'd been held up by the snow, but was on his way back. The last thing she needed was this boy. The most surprising thing was that he was actually quite, like, like chatty and ch more, like, human than I expected, like, because some of his books are quite, like, surreal and quite dark, so I was expecting him to be a bit more unreal. It's good for me to meet the people who read my books, so it, I get a lot out of it. I get a huge amount just to get feedback. And of course, kids are famously blunt. It's wonderful. If they don't like your work, they just, they just tell you. Um, and if they do like your work and tell you, then you know they really mean it. Yeah, it inspired me to write more because I thought he was a good role model and I could learn off him and be good and successful like he was. I've already actually started writing a story. Um, and I've done the first few chapters, and I think I'm going to go back and like re-edit it. I thought it was good. I really enjoyed it. You know, um, I mean, the kids were great. They were really well prepared. Nice for them to realise that authors are just human beings. You know, with two arms, two legs, and a sense of humour. You know, the same as them, really. Um, that they watch Strictly Come Dancing and go to Tesco's every so often. It's nice for them to know that they're not just the name on the spine of a book. The most surprising thing I found was um, that he supported South End United. <laughs> Tips on making the most of an author visit can be found on the Teachers TV website.